This is, I think it's Lawrence Alma Tadema. Yes, it is. The Meeting of Antony and Cleopatra. As we all know, one of the most famous love stories in history. Also, one of the most important when you bear in mind its many consequences. I will come to the details of it, though, as and when. So let's start at the beginning. And let's start where we finished last week. By 45 BC, and for a few years before then, Julius Caesar has established a permanent military dictatorship. There is no limit to how long he wants to hold the dictatorship. Indeed, the Senate eventually declares him dictator for life, which only gives a formal polish to what he has already established in fact. The Republican constitution has broken down. Exactly when it has broken down is very difficult to say because it happened in stages. You could say it broke down around 120 BC with the Gracchus brothers. You could say it broke down in 80 BC with the Sulla purges. You could say it broke down in about 60 BC with the first triumvirate. But there is no doubt that by 45 BC, the Republican constitution has been replaced by a permanent military dictatorship. Because nobody can think of any alternative, Caesar's military dictatorship is not concealed, but Caesar rules through the traditional institutions of state. There are still two consuls, and indeed in 44 BC, Caesar was one of the consuls. There were ten tribunes elected. The Senate deliberated. The popular assemblies were called and consulted. But all of the important decisions were taken by Caesar. That is what Caesar expected to continue for the rest of his life, and that is what everybody else expected. The problem with the system is that it was inherently unstable. Caesar, by 45 BC, is in his mid-50s, which is an advanced age for that time. It was unlikely that Caesar would still be around in 10 years' time. Nobody knew what would happen when Caesar died. All of the accumulation of powers he had taken were offices within the constitution, and they all lapsed on his death. There was nobody with clear succession to Caesar, and even if Caesar had an elder son in his 20s, there was no formal mechanism by which Caesar's powers could be smoothly transferred to his son. This led to a certain amount of political instability despite Caesar's control over Roman politics. Then on the 15th of March, 43 BC, Caesar is assassinated in the Senate House, stabbed 23 times. The assassination was plotted by Brutus, Cassio, Cato the Younger, Cinna, and various other disaffected members of the senatorial aristocracy. They believe, or they seem to have believed, that it would be followed by a great outburst of popular support. They do seem to have believed that Caesar's rule was unpopular and that its apparent popularity was an effect of fear and Caesar's propaganda. However, when Brutus tried to make a speech in the Senate justifying his action, all the senators, except for his fellow conspirators, had made a run for it. And when they ran through the streets of Rome shouting, people of Rome, you are free again, the the response of most people was to lock themselves indoors. The murder is regarded with fear and horror by most people. You have a few days of fast-moving instability. The first and perhaps the most important step on the way towards some return to stability is Mark Antony. He is Caesar's fellow consul for the year, and I'll say more about him in a few minutes. He goes straight to Caesar's house, speaks to Caesar's wife, and he lays hands on the whole of Caesar's vast fortune and all of his papers, very important assets. Then Marcus Lepidus, a Caesar loyalist, just happens to have an army outside the city. He brings us into the city to keep peace, which means there is no rioting. 
Then on the 17th of September, two days after the murder, Mark Antony, as consul, convenes the Senate. The Senate votes a full amnesty to all the assassins. It also ratifies all of Caesar's acts, all of the laws that Caesar has made. Not just the laws he has published so far, but all the laws that he may have been about to publish, which is a very important asset to Antony because he is in possession of Caesar's papers, which apparently have a listing of the laws that he intended to make. All of these acts, made or not yet published, are given blanket ratification. And then, just to make sure that everything is set in concrete, Caesar is declared a god by the Senate, which means that it's not only politically unwise, but it is a kind of sacrilege to propose any repeal or significant weakening of Caesar's new laws. This is to reassure people that the same rowing back will not take place that we see after the death of the Gracchus brothers. Civil war appears to have been avoided. The Senate has sort of taken charge under direction of the consul and with the consent of the conspirators, and a compromise appears to have been reached. Everything Caesar has done cannot be undone, but the Republic is restored in its full working. That evening, Mark Antony and the conspirators have dinner together. The conspirators just happen to consent to Mark Antony's perhaps rather vague suggestion that he should give a speech the following day at Caesar's funeral. Probably a big mistake for the conspirators. I think we can call this the most famous speech in history. We've all seen the play. You may have seen it in the theatre. You may have seen it on television. You must have seen the version with Marlon Brando as Mark Antony, which is a very fine performance. But here is the original source from which Shakespeare took his inspiration. Then when Caesar's body was brought into the forum, Antonius gave the funeral speech, as is the custom in Rome listing in full all of Caesar's accomplishments. As he noticed that his speech was touching the hearts of the crowd, he changed his tone to pity. He grabbed Caesar's clothes and showed them, stained with blood to the crowd, while pointing out the gashes and great number of wounds. One could see then that there was not going to be order any longer. Some people shouted to kill the murderers, while others brought up benches and tables from the workshops into the forum. And, as happened to Clodius the demagogue years earlier, they made a huge funeral pyre and set fire to it. They set the corpse on it, in the middle of the temple, shrines and sacred places. As the fire blazed, some brought forth half-burned torches and scattered in all directions to burn down the houses of Caesar's murderers. We don't know whether Antony intended to stand by the compromise reached in the Senate on the 17th, but there is no doubt that after he had given this inflammatory speech, yes, let's call it an inflammatory speech, after Mark Antony had given his speech, that was it. There was no further compromise. The question then is who next? It's not a question of what next, it's a question of who next. Somebody needs to rule the Republic, or somebody needs to rule Rome and its empire. The question is, who will it be? So let's go through the dramatis personae, and we begin with Mark Antony. He's the son of a corrupt and incompetent and eventually bankrupt senator. Antony appears to have spent his youth and early manhood in a continual round of drinking, sex, and generally making trouble in Rome. Lots of gambling from which he accumulated very large debts. He was accused by Cicero of having been the passive lover of Gaius Scribonius Curio. I don't know whether it's true, but it's there in the second Philippic in all its entertaining details. But eventually, in 54 BC, Antony joins Caesar in Gaul, where Caesar is conquering the whole country, and to the surprise of many who had known him, he distinguishes himself in the military sphere. He turns out to be not only a competent senior officer, he turns out to be an inspired military leader. Then, in 49 BC, 
Antony's back in Rome. He's elected one of the ten tribunes, which, remember, gives him the power to veto any act of the Senate or the Assembly. His job as tribune is to secure Caesar against his enemies in the Senate. Remember again that when the Senate eventually moves against Caesar in 49 BC, Antony does try to veto the acts, but instead he is expelled from the Senate and he is threatened with violence and has to leave Rome where he joins Caesar. So he becomes Caesar's second in command in the civil war and gains a further solid military reputation. Now, after the civil war, from 47 to 45 BC, he's back in Rome as governor of Italy, while Caesar finishes sorting out the provinces. Here, Antony makes Caesar angry. Some of Caesar's supporters have proposed a wholesale debt cancellation, or at least a great deal of debt relief. Antony vetoes this. Antony prevents it from happening. And when the matter is pushed by Caesar's other supporters, Antony uses violence against them. Caesar is displeased. Displeased maybe because wholesale debt relief was on his personal agenda. Displeased also, and perhaps more likely, because Antony's rather intemperate actions had polarised opinions and made it harder to reach a compromise in the end. But whatever the case, once Caesar was back in Rome from 45 BC, there's a reconciliation and Caesar and Antony are the joint consuls for the year in 44 BC when Caesar is killed. For whatever reason, Antony is not named in Caesar's will. Antony is Caesar's second in command. After the death, Antony has seized control of Caesar's money and Caesar's papers, both of which give him a great deal of power. He's also regarded as the greatest military leader after Caesar himself which puts him in a good position to step into Caesar's shoes, except that he has not been named in the will. Cicero, he's in his 60s, which, by the standards of the day, makes him decidedly past it. After the Civil War, in which he gave full support, even amounting to turning up in the military camp, after the Civil War, in which he gave full support to Pompey, he was forgiven by Caesar, Although, when he returned to Rome, it was to go into semi-retirement to write books on philosophy, Cicero remains the most honoured and the most distinguished of all the senators. Caesar treats him with the utmost respect. Cicero is not involved in the assassination. Indeed, he knows absolutely nothing about it until he sees it. But he hails it immediately as a great and beautiful deed, but incomplete. Cicero believes that Antony should have been killed alongside Caesar. After the death, Cicero returns to active politics. What he wanted is rather hard to say, but it appears that he wanted to be the unofficial ruler of the public. He would mediate all disputes, and he would ensure that a government of all the good took power, a concordium omnium bonorum, a government in which his plutocratic friends could regain power, and they would keep the masses quiet by not flaunting their position and behaving in a generally decent and sober manner. He hates Mark Antony because Antony has connections with the populists. He also hates Antony for personal reasons, and again, he deeply regrets that the conspirators only killed Caesar. He believes that it was a serious mistake that they did not add Antony to the list of people to kill. Cicero takes charge of the Senate. Cicero is the leader of the Senate. The majority of the senators look to Cicero for guidance. But with Brutus and Cassius and the other main conspirators all out of Rome, they've all gone off to govern the provinces that Caesar allotted and that were ratified by the Senate after the assassination. With the conspirators out of Rome, Cicero has no military backing. He has no effective way of countering the rise of Antony. Next on the list of dramatist personae, Gaius Octavius, born 63 BC, which means that he was 19 
when Caesar is assassinated. He's born into an old but very undistinguished family, a family from outside Rome, but his grandmother, one of his grandmothers, was the sister of Julius Caesar, which makes him Caesar's great-nephew. Remember, Caesar had a daughter, but she dies in childbirth when married to Pompey, so Caesar has no natural heirs, or rather, he does have one, but we'll come to him in a moment. In 46 BC, when he's only 17, he impresses Caesar by taking a dangerous trip through occupied territory in Spain to join Caesar in the last big campaign of the Civil War. Back in Rome, Caesar makes his will, and unknown to everyone until after his death, he appoints young Octavian as his heir. It seems rather strange to appoint somebody so young, but Caesar doubtless expected that since he was in fairly decent health, except for a touch of epilepsy, he would carry on another five, maybe even another ten years, by which time Octavius would be in full manhood. But for whatever reason, and with whatever motives, Caesar appoints Octavian the heir in his will, with a two-thirds share in his property, and he posthumously adopts him as his son, something which you can do under Roman law. It would be uh, at least somewhat irregular under English law. Octavian is out of Rome at the time of the assassination. He doesn't turn up for nearly two months. He turns up in Rome on the 6th of May, 44 BC. He finds that his entire legacy is controlled by Antony, and Antony won't hand over a penny. Antony dismisses him as a boy who owes everything to his name. Antony does not regard Octavian as any kind of competitor. Octavian, however, is a most determined young man. He responds by giving lavish games at his own expense to, to impress the Roman people. He then raises a private army from Caesar's veterans. These veterans like the idea of supporting a man who promises justice for the assassins, and he also promises them the land that Caesar had promised them, but which they still have not received from Antony. The Senate has ratified the land grant, but the commissioners have not yet been appointed or sent into action to identify the land and to allot it among the veterans. Octavian takes on the name of Gaius Julius Caesar, it's his name now, he's adopted, and he approaches the veterans and says, I am Caesar's son, and I promise, I absolutely promise that I'll give you the land my father promised you. Young Octavian, he's young, although he's not super rich, he's rich enough to maintain his own army. He's taken on Caesar's name and added on to the end of that, Divi Filius, son of a god. He's soon drifting into a conflict with Antony. Oh, dramatis personae Cleopatra. Where does she stand in this? Remember, she's the daughter of Ptolemy VIII, Auletes, and as such, she's a direct descendant of Ptolemy I, one of Alexander the Great's old school friends, who grabbed Egypt in the collapse of Alexander's empire. In 51 BC, she becomes joint ruler of Egypt with her brother and husband, Ptolemy XIII. She's soon in a civil war with him for control of all of Egypt. 48 BC, Caesar just happens to arrive in Alexandria in pursuit of Pompey. He settles the civil war in favour of Cleopatra. Cleopatra then marries her youngest brother, who's only 12 at the time, and she reigns with him, uh, having given him the title of Ptolemy XIV. She then has an affair with Caesar and gives birth to a son, who is called Caesarion. In 44 BC, Cleopatra is in Rome, on official business as the Egyptian head of state. She remains in Rome for about a month after the assassination, trying without success to get the Senate to recognise Caesarion as Caesar's heir. Not something that can be done, because Caesar's will has nominated Octavian, and the Senate would never, the Roman people would never have accepted a half-Greek as Caesar's heir. Cleopatra leaves Rome, back in Egypt. She has her young brother Ptolemy XIV poisoned, as one does, and she names her son Caesarion as co-ruler and gives him the name of Ptolemy XV. 
she appears to have wanted to keep Egypt as independent or as independent as could be achieved in a world ruled by Rome. She is very popular among both Greeks and natives in Egypt. She is, of course, fluent in Greek because she is Greek, but she's also fluent in the Egyptian language. And outside Alexandria, she takes on the full regalia of an Egyptian pharaoh. There you are. There is a representation of Cleopatra in traditional Egyptian style. And here is her possible autograph. It's an Egyptian state document of the 23rd of February, 33 BC, and it has the Greek word genisthoi, let it be so, written at the bottom. That could perhaps have been written by one of her ministers, but the general consensus is that, yes, it probably is the handwriting of Cleopatra herself, which makes this the only example we have of an autograph manuscript by a person of some note in the ancient world. I said that Octavian and Antony are drifting into conflict with each other. This is partly because of Cicero. In late 44 BC, Cicero feels secure enough in his control of the Senate and in the Senate's control of Rome and Italy to give a series of very great but extraordinarily unpleasant speeches, his Philippic orations. These are all directed against Mark Antony, and the second Philippic, which is the longest and the most lurid of all of them, heaps up a mass of dirt against Mark Antony. This is where we get the story of his youthful career as a rent boy. Bearing in mind that those accusations Cicero makes against Antony that we can check against the known facts turn out to have been at least distorted. The nature of his affair with Curio is to be taken as somewhat mysterious. It probably did happen, but whether it happened in the manner of Cicero's description is not something anyone can say. But when Antony read the second Philippic, he exploded with outrage, and he and his wife never forgave Cicero. Indeed, the second Philippic was so inflammatory that Cicero didn't dare give it as a speech in the Senate. Instead, he published it and allowed it to circulate, which is what brought it to Antony's attention. I said that Cicero feels secure in both Rome and Italy. This is because he has now formed an alliance with young Octavian. Yes, he hailed the murder of Julius Caesar as a great and noble deed, but he has now jumped into political bed with Caesar's anointed heir. He does this because Antony has steadily refused to give any acknowledgement of Octavian's claim to be Caesar's heir. He still hasn't handed over any money. He has still given, as I said, no recognition to Octavian as Caesar's heir. Octavian is increasingly angry at this. He is growing in popularity among Caesar's veterans. He finds it convenient to join with Cicero, just as Cicero finds it convenient to join with him. The peace established after the death of Caesar is fragile, very fragile. Brutus and Cassius are ruling large parts of the east. Nobody wants them back in Rome. They might want to return to Rome, but the time is not right. But Brutus's younger brother, he's the governor of Transalpine Gaul. That's that area on the map that's circled in red. Remember that Gaul is not just the territory of modern France, it's also much of the territory of northern Italy. In 44 BC, Brutus's brother is the governor of Gaul between the Rubicon and the Alps. Antony insists on expelling him from the province because he wants it for himself. This is a hostile act against an official representative of the Roman state. Cicero takes his chance, and he gets a declaration from the Senate declaring that Antony is an enemy of the Roman people. He's declared a traitor, and both consuls are given an army and sent against him. 
Young Octavian, who's not expected to achieve very much, is sent along with the consuls to give moral support. It will cheer up the veterans when they have to fight Mark Antony if they can see that Caesar's adopted son is part of the command. You then have one of those strange events in history where everything changes, largely by accident. 21st of April, 43 BC, the Battle of Mutina in northern Italy. Antony is defeated by the senatorial army, but both consuls are killed. One of them is killed on the field of battle, the other dies of his wounds. Which means that although Antony has been defeated and is forced out of northern Italy, the only surviving commander on the senatorial side just happens to be Octavian. He arrives back in Rome at the head of a victorious army. He is only 20, but he demands to be made one of the consuls. Remember, the consuls are both dead. When both consuls die, it is for the Senate to fill up the number by a resolution. Octavian says, I want to be one of the consuls, and here my friend Pideus, I think, here my friend will be the consul with me. The Senate refuses on the grounds that Octavian is grossly underage. You need to be in your 40s before you can be a consul. You can't be a consul when you're 20. But these are not normal times. Octavian has an army. He leads the army into Rome. He leads some of his soldiers into the Senate chamber. He then resubmits the motion. Can I please be declared consul for the year to fill up the vacancy? It's one of those deals that they're unable to refuse. Octavian is appointed the consul for the year. Now that Octavian has an official position in the Republic, one of his first acts is to declare all of the assassins traitors, enemies of the Roman people, and outlaws, upon which he prepares for a renewed civil war. Here is Cicero as a politician. These are extracts from his letters. There is no doubt that Cicero was the greatest master of Latin prose. He was a philosopher of considerable ability. He is, in general terms, a very great man. But he was a weak and vacillating politician. Look at this first letter. A letter to Mark Antony, April 44 BC. With regard to your communication to me by letter, I should have preferred you to conduct it with me face to face. For this one reason, you could have gleaned not only from my words, but also from my features, eyes and brow, as the saying goes, my friendly feeling towards you, for I have always regarded you with affection. That is in April 44 BC, a letter to Mark Antony. A year later... 43 BC, he's writing to one of the assassins, and this was his opinion, even when he was writing to Antony. How I wish that you had invited me to that most attractive feast on the Ides of March. We would have had no leftovers, but as things stand, the leftovers, i.e. Mark Antony, have caused such complications that sacred service you render to the state is arousing some complaints. Cicero does not always tell the truth, that much is clear. And then he writes to his good friend Atticus in April 44 BC, Octavian is staying with me. His attitude is most respectful and most friendly. His supporters hail him as Caesar, though Philippus does not, and accordingly neither do I. He cannot, in my view, be a good private citizen, for he is surrounded by so many who repeatedly threaten our followers with death, and say that this present situation is intolerable. Later in the year, November, he writes again to Atticus, Two letters for me from Octavian in one day. Now he wants me to return to Rome at once. Says he wants to work through the Senate. I replied that the Senate could not meet before the canons of January, which I believe is the case. He adds, with your advice. In short, he presses and I play for time. I don't trust his age and I don't know what he's after. A few weeks later, he writes to Atticus, We must praise the young man, Octavian, reward him, discard him. 
Cicero regards Octavian as a disposable aid in his vendetta against Antony. What Octavian brings to the table is the name of Julius Caesar, the fact that he is the great man's heir, and the fact that he is a competent general and popular with the veterans. Cicero does not regard him as a permanent fixture in Roman politics. He will use him and get rid of him. Octavian's view is, I'm afraid, rather similar. November 43 BC. After nearly 18 months of rivalry that has sometimes spilled over into bloodshed on the field of battle, Octavian and Antony realise that they have no immediate interest in continuing their feud. Antony himself, he has no interest in pursuing the assassins. What he seems to want is an easy life and a good reputation, as long as he has enough money to pay for drink and sex and a general good time, and as long as everyone points him in the street and says, there goes Mark Antony, a very great man, he's happy. Starting a civil war to punish the assassins of Caesar, that's not even partly on his agenda. But there is the matter of Octavian. He has a total commitment to avenging Caesar and then himself becoming Caesar. He wants to step into Caesar's shoes. Both Octavian and Antony are standing in each other's way. Either they will continue this feud and destroy each other, to the great benefit of Cicero and his plutocratic friends, or they can come to an arrangement. A partnership of two, a political partnership of two, is always rather unstable. We can think of examples in our own lifetime. Tony Blair and Gordon Brown. That didn't work out too well in the end. In order to have a stable partnership in politics, it's a good idea to have three, just as the first triumvirate was Caesar, Pompey, Crassus. So the second triumvirate is Octavian, Antony, oh, and Lepidus, a man of limited ability, but he was a Caesar loyalist. He's the man who led an army into Rome on the evening of the assassination to stabilise the city. He's taken in as the third partner in the triumvirate. Now, the conference at Bononia, in which the three men sat down and agreed the terms of the triumvirate, that is different from the agreement made between Caesar, Pompey and Crassus. The first triumvirate is a purely informal arrangement, which is cemented by ties of interest and, of course, the marriage of Caesar's daughter to Pompey. This triumvirate is a formal written document the, which appoints these three men. It is the triumvirate with consular powers for saving the Republic. Triumviri Republicae Constituendi Consulari Potestate. The document is laid before the Senate and the Assembly for ratification, and these three men, Octavian, Antony, Lepidus, are immediately given supreme power in Rome. They stand above all the magistrates, they stand above the Senate itself, they are given supreme power for five years for the purpose of avenging Caesar's assassination. Although this political agreement is only supposed to run for five years, no one seriously expects normal government ever to be restored. This is the new order of things. Here is a map showing the Roman world at the time of the making of this third triumvirate. It's rather a confusing situation, but the red areas in the east, those are controlled by Brutus and Cassius. Those are controlled by the assassins of Julius Caesar. The rest, well, as I said, it's a bit of a mess. You've got, you've got Gaul, Spain, Italy, and North Africa, plus the islands. Some of these are controlled by Antony, some by Octavian, some by Lepidus. Sicily itself is controlled by the son of Pompey the Great. Pompey is dead, but his son is still around, and he is insisting that he should have a seat at the top table of Roman politics. He 
ironically has turned into a pirate chief. His father cleared the Mediterranean of pirates. Now his son is resuming pirate operations, not on the same disordered scale of the old pirates, but he controls Sicily, some of the Mediterranean islands. He has a large fleet. His power is outside the constitution, but it has to be taken into account. And Antony and Octavian both make a semi-formal deal with Pompey the Younger. If you can live with this spectrum of colours, there is, broadly speaking, the West against the East. The triumvirate has been formed. It has all the power it needs. However, there are two problems outstanding. The first is that they still have a fair bit of opposition in the Senate. The second is that they have no money. Antony has run through the immense fortune that Caesar had at his death, and they need to raise an army of 45 legions to make sure that the civil war is won very quickly. They don't have money for raising 45 legions. So remember what I said a few weeks ago, that wealth was massively concentrated at the top in the Roman world. You have a super rich plutocracy, and this is ripe for the picking. The triumvirs, they make up a death list of around 200 rich men who are, with more or less truth, accused of having been accomplices in the assassination of Julius Caesar. These men are marked out for death and their estates for confiscation. According to the historians, according to Plutarch, according to Dio Cassius, according to various of the historians, Octavian himself was reluctant to have a prescription. It was demanded by Antony and by Lepidus. And apparently, when Cicero's name was added to the list, Octavian argued for three days to keep his name off. This is what the historians say, and doubtless they are taking their claim from Augustus himself. Of course, afterwards, when the civil wars are over and Octavian has become the great Augustus, he does not really want to be known as the man who signed Cicero's death warrant, the greatest of all Roman prose writers. So, of course, he'll throw the blame on Antony and Lepidus. Or it may be that Octavian just didn't see any point in having so many men on the death list and none in putting Cicero on it. Whatever the case, this death list of around 500 rich men is agreed. These men are put to death, those who don't get away. And Cicero is one of them. Here is a representation on the right of Cicero's death, which may or may not be realistic. There are several stories. One is that Cicero was chased through Italy, Antony's men caught up with him, and he was killed in this manner. There is then a story by Seneca the Younger, who says that Cicero retired to one of his country villas, lay on a couch, and asked one of his slaves to cut his head off. We don't know what happened, but we do know that Cicero died as a result of the prescription. Here is a story from Plutarch's life of Cicero. When Cicero's extremities were brought to Rome, Antony ordered the head and hands to be placed over the ship's beaks on the rostra, a sight that made the Romans shudder, for they thought that they saw there not the face of Cicero, but an image of the soul of Antony. However, he showed at least one sentiment of fair dealing in the case when he handed over Philologus to Pomponia, the wife of Quintus, that's Cicero's brother. And she, having got the man into her power, or let me explain, Philologus appears to have betrayed Cicero to Mark Antony. Antony promised a reward, and Philologus said, well, Cicero is there, go and get him. Antony said, okay, but as a slave, you have no right to betray your master in this way. So instead of rewarding him, Antony handed him over to Cicero's sister-in-law. And she, having got the man into her power, besides other dreadful punishments which she inflicted upon him, forced him to cut off his own flesh bit by bit and roast it, and then to eat it. This indeed is what some of the historians say. 
but Cicero's own freedman Tiro makes no mention at all of the treachery of Philologus, so you can make of that what you will. It goes back to our discussion of slavery in the Roman world. You could do anything you wanted to your slaves. You could even do that. Whether this was done to this particular slave is not something I can say, but it was legally permitted to force the slave to cut bits of his own flesh off, to roast them, and then to eat them in, in the midst of other horrible torments. Yes, the Romans were not like us. At least I hope that we are not like the Romans in that respect. The Civil War. Histories of the period spend a lot of time discussing the Civil War, the various moves, the battles, the aftermath, and so on. But I, I don't see much point in going into details on the Civil War. What matters is that in 42 BC, there is a short campaign against the assassins. They lose. They lose every battle. Cassius is defeated, then Brutus is defeated. They both commit suicide. The action moves to North Africa, where Cato the Younger is holding out with some of the other assassins. They are defeated. They commit suicide. That's the end of the conspiracy against Caesar. The Roman world has been united and largely pacified under the rule of these three men, or including Pompey's son, these four or three and a half men. The question is what happens next? It's always what happens next in politics. There's never a time for saying, we have achieved this, therefore we can sit down and enjoy the fruits of our labours. You can't do that. The question is, yes, you've done that. What are you going to do now? You've overcome these challenges. What about these challenges which have suddenly arisen because of your solution to the previous challenges? It's the same in 42 BC. The purpose for which the Triumvirate was formed is achieved. The assassins have all, well, they're all dead. The conspiracy is over. What next? Well, the Roman world is not at peace. During the Civil War, the Parthians have taken advantage of the preoccupation of Rome, and they have invaded and occupied Syria, which is something that the Romans cannot allow. They will not allow another first-class military power to have an outlet to the Mediterranean. You can't do that. It is our sea, Mare Nostrum. Antony goes east to clear out the Parthians. Antony is rather pleased to go east because the problems in Rome are accumulating. There are a hundred thousand veterans, not only Caesar's veterans, but the veterans of this new civil war. They've all been promised substantial land grants in Italy. Somebody has to find all of that land. Antony would rather not do it because he is intellectually rather lazy. So he goes east to clear the Parthians out of Syria, leaving Octavian behind in Rome to sort out the mess. Octavian does this, he does it with great efficiency and ruthlessness. He confiscates large areas of Italy, mostly from his surviving political opponents, but sometimes at random. For example, the poet Virgil, his family had a small farm north of the Rubicon, in the Italian part of Gaul, Octavian's commissioners turn up, they evict Virgil's family, saying, no, it's confiscated, sorry, be off with you. It's only because Virgil manages to come to the attention of Octavian on account of his talents that the farm is restored. Octavian's ruthless and sweeping land confiscations make him hated for a while in Italy. But those 100,000 men, they are given the land. Caesar veterans have been promised this for years. At last, Octavian's given it to them. So there's a solid constituency backing Octavian in any dispute. He's the man who gave them the land. And all the veterans of the latest civil war against Brutus and Cassius, those have been given land. The losers don't like Octavian, but the losers are smaller in number than the gainers. In 40 BC, Octavian and Antony get into a dispute, largely to do with Antony's wife Fulvia. I won't go into the details. What does matter, though, is that in 40 BC, Octavian and Antony redivide the Roman world. Octavian gets the West, 
and Rome. He gets Italy, Rome and the West, except for Sicily and the bits that are held by Lepidus and by the younger Pompey. And Antony gets the East. Again, a personal connection is always a good idea. So Antony marries Octavian's sister, a repeat of the links that united Pompey and Caesar for a while. This, however, is unlikely to be as solid a link because although Antony is now married to Octavia, he is also settled in the East with Cleopatra as his mistress. This is a map of the Roman world in 34 BC. The red line divides the Roman world. Indeed, this red line is very important because to the west, the main language is Latin. To the east, the main language is Greek. This division appears again 400 years later in 395 AD when Theodosius the Great divides the empire between his two sons, one ruling from Ravenna in the west the other ruling from Constantinople in the east. But the division is made. It's a reasonable division. It splits the Mediterranean in half. It also splits it according to linguistic domination. Latin is by no means as dominant in the west as it later became, but it is the clear leader in the west. In 36 BC, Octavian decides to stop sharing the West with Lepidus, who has a bit of North Africa, and with Pompey's son, who has Sicily. First of all, Octavian gets a fleet and defeats Pompey, taking over his share of the West. He then declares that Lepidus was an accomplice of Pompey and deprives him. Octavian is not interested in murdering his political opponents, not unless it's necessary. So, first of all, he confines Lepidus to house arrest and then allows him to resume his seat in the Senate. But Octavian largely ignores the man for the rest of his life. But this is the Roman world in 34 BC. Octavian is ruling the West through the Senate and through the traditional institutions of state. It appears that he is simply the strong man stabilising a restored republic, though no one really believes that. But in the East, Antony is ruling those Roman territories, those territories which have been conquered with much expense of Roman blood. He's ruling the East as his own personal estate. He's moved his capital to Alexandria, and he rules with Cleopatra as his consort. And these are the donations of Alexandria in 34 BC. During his lifetime, Antony rules all of that, but he's transferred Crete and Cyprus, which are Roman possessions, to Egyptian possessions. They are transferred to Cleopatra to rule. He also divides the empire in the east among his various children that he has by Cleopatra, and there are three. He regards his marriage to Octavian's sister as a nullity. He regards his relationship with Cleopatra as effectively a marriage. And in 32 BC, he formally divorces Octavia. Here's a rather fanciful painting of Antony and Cleopatra. He probably didn't have a beard, and Cleopatra didn't dress like that. Remember, although she was queen of Egypt, she ruled as a Greek woman from Alexandria, a Greek city. She certainly wore Egyptian clothing when she showed herself to her Egyptian subjects, but in Alexandria itself, she dressed like any other super wealthy Greek. But... More solidly, here is a silver coin which has Cleopatra on one face and Antony on the other. It shows a joint rule of the East by Antony and Cleopatra. Here is another fanciful painting from 1653. Apparently, in their life of riotous luxury in Alexandria, Cleopatra once said, I can spend 10 million sesterces on a single dinner. That's approximately 10 million pounds in our money. No one believed that she could do that. So she took a cup of wine and dropped into it an expensive pearl, dissolved it and drank the wine. 
That's what Plutarch says. I read many years ago that you can't do this. You can't dissolve pearls in wine. You can't dissolve them in vinegar. If you want to dissolve pearls, you need a rather strong acid, which it would be inadvisable to drink afterwards. But never mind. The important point is that Antony and Cleopatra live lives of riotous luxury together in Alexandria, and they are ruling the Eastern Roman Empire as their personal domain. Here on the right are the twins that Cleopatra gave to Antony in 40 BC. The one on the left, the girl, is Antonia, and you'll hear more of her shortly. Let's go back to young Octavian in the West. I've said that he rules with some show of respect for the Senate and some regard for the traditional order. I've said that in 36 BC, he ends his coexistence with the son of Pompey and immediately afterwards finds a reason to remove Lepidus as the warlord of North Africa and places him under house arrest. He's purged the Senate of all active opposition. There is still a great deal of opposition in the Senate, but it is not active. The senators remaining, those are loyal to him, or they are silent. The thing about Octavian is that he's not a nice young man. He is entirely willing to kill his opponents if they get seriously in his way, If their lives become an inconvenience for him, he will kill them. But he would rather not kill them. He would rather intimidate people into submission, or he'll punish them with house arrest or exile. Killing is something that Octavian is entirely willing to do, and he'll do so with an entirely cold heart. But he finds it a messy and inefficient way of dealing with opposition. He would rather deal with it in more gentle ways. He certainly rules Italy with what I describe in the slide as firm justice. Italy has not been returned to the state that the Gracchus brothers had in mind. There are still immensely rich people in Rome who control a lot of the land in Italy. However, remember that Octavian has found land for a 100,000 veterans. This is an immense redistribution of land in Italy. It changes the pattern of land ownership for several centuries. He also completes the resettlement of the Roman poor in the new rebuilt cities of Carthage and Corinth and the entirely new cities of Arles in southern France and of Seville in Spain. This makes Rome a much more salubrious place because it's not filled with so many paupers. It also removes a great deal of bitterness and potential for bloodshed from Roman city politics. And as I said, it also brings about not a sweeping transformation of land ownership in Italy. This is not the Gracchus Revolution, but it is the next best thing to it. Because Octavian is an entirely competent ruler, prosperity returns in the West. Everyone begins to look to young Octavian. He's a permanent ruler and he is acceptable to the great majority of people, though the senatorial aristocracy still doesn't like him. But because Octavian is still in his 20s, Nobody can see any problem yet of succession. The exact nature of Octavian's power, its legal basis, can be put on hold. Nobody wants to discuss these matters because it isn't necessary to discuss them. Octavian is young, in apparently good health. He will probably be around for a very long time to come. That is the best anyone can want at the moment. Octavian is not just a man of ability in his own right. He is also surrounded by associates of very high ability who are totally loyal to him. There is Agrippa, his military chief, and then there's Mycenas, his minister of propaganda, a very important role, bearing in mind the somewhat ambiguous nature of Octavian's power. Now here is the West in about 32 BC. Octavian controls the whole of the West. Italy 
that rather orangey area. That officially is controlled by the Senate, but since Octavian controls the Senate, it amounts to the same thing. Everything else west of the green areas on the northern and southern shores of the Mediterranean is under Octavian's total control. Everything to the east, and again you have different colours, that is controlled by Antony. How long will this situation continue? How long will the Roman world be divided between these two men? Well, not for much longer. Remember in 32 BC, Antony divorces Octavian's sister, sends a letter telling her to leave the house. Get out of my house, you are divorced. Octavian chooses to take this as a declaration of war. In the short term, he does nothing much. In 32 BC, Antony collects large forces and he moves into Greece with Cleopatra in support. He prepares an invasion of Italy. This is a serious public relations mistake. He's ruling the East. And again, remember, the East has been conquered, regardless of the justice of the matter. The East has been conquered with much outpouring of Roman blood over several centuries. Antony is now ruling it as his personal domain with Cleopatra, the Greek queen of Egypt, as his consort. This is deeply offensive to Romans in the West. After Antony divorces Octavian's sister, Octavian goes to the Vestal Virgins and bullies them into handing over Antony's will. It was the custom of aristocratic Romans to lodge their wills with the Vestal Virgins for safekeeping. Octavian gets hold of this, he opens it, and he sees that after Antony's death, the whole of the East is to be partitioned between the children that Antony has had with Cleopatra and, of course, giving a large share to Caesarion, Cleopatra's son by Julius Caesar. It means that the East, after Antony's death, will be partitioned and ruled by a half-Greek dynasty. This is a terrible scandal. The scandal is orchestrated by this man in the picture, Gaius Mycenas. I'll show you a picture in a minute, but he is a minister of propaganda. He doesn't hold the title, but that's what he amounts to, and he is a propagandist of genius. He is the man who gathers around Augustus Virgil, Horace, Propertius, Tibullus, and for a while Ovid. He gives a great deal of support to Livy in his writing of the history of Rome. The greatest names in Roman literature, they are assembled around Augustus. Their job is to make subtle propaganda, not for Augustus yet, but for Octavian. I refer to Mycenas as a propagandist of genius. If you compare him with the Soviet propagandists in the 20th century, you can see the difference. If Mycenas had been a crude propagandist, he would have commissioned a stream of gross and insincere flattery of Octavian, calling him the new Dionysus, the second Romulus, a godlike saviour. Every poem, every work of history would have been centred around Octavius. But Mycenas didn't do that. He told Virgil, Ovid, Horace, Tibullus, Propertius, etc., write whatever you like, do not grotesquely flatter the boss, but make sure that he gets continual veiled mentions. Make sure that the idea is spread that he's here for a long time to come and that all is right with the world. When Mycenas is given the job of blackening Antony's character, it's very easy. You put the word round, Antony has been seduced from Roman virtue by an Eastern seductress. Antony and Cleopatra, they're preparing to invade Italy and subject Italy and Rome to foreign rule. Octavian is shown as the defender of Roman traditions and of all Western peoples. Antony is hardly mentioned except as Antony was a great man. Antony could still be a great man, but he has been seduced from the true way of Roman virtue by this ghastly Egyptian queen. 
we must save the East from Antony, and we must save Antony from himself. When Octavian finally declares war, it's not on Antony, it's on Egypt. It's a foreign war, not a civil war. But although Octavian has a good case, and although Mycenaeus makes the best of that case, Octavian does not have it all his way in the West. Many senators and both consuls defect to Antony when the civil war is declared. So Octavian's hold on the Roman upper class is still rather tenuous. His hold on the people appears to be absolutely solid, but his hold on the plutocracy is provisional. However, this is another uneven civil war. Antony's strategy is to use Egypt's money to raise a large army and a large fleet, transport the lot to Greece, get it across the sea to Italy, and then march on Rome. But it doesn't go to plan. In the first place, as soon as Antony and Cleopatra have landed their army in Greece, Octavian takes control of the eastern Mediterranean and cuts off communications between Egypt and Greece. Then there's no land battle, but there is a naval battle at Actium, off the coast of western Greece, 2nd September 31 BC. Complete victory for Octavian. Cleopatra turns and runs. Antony turns and runs. Uh, there is a picture of Mycenaeus holding court in his house. He's described by Velaeus Peterculus, whose life overlapped with that of Mycenaeus, a man of sleepless vigilance in critical emergencies, far-seeing and knowing how to act, but in his relaxation from business, more luxurious and effeminate than a woman. Make of that what you will. He is not a man to be despised. Remember when Pompey lost at Pharsalus? He ran for Egypt. Caesar followed directly after and arrived off Alexandria just a few days after Pompey's murder. Well, it's the same again. Another defeated leader in a Roman civil war heads for Egypt. This time, though, Octavian doesn't bother following. He has other business to attend to. Antony and Cleopatra go back to Alexandria, and they do very little there. They go back to their lives of riotous luxury. It is possible... We don't know for sure, but it's possible that Cleopatra herself was in negotiations with the Parthians, inviting them to invade the East and to secure Egypt from Roman conquest. But whether or not that was happening, nothing came of it. The Parthians probably realised that it's best not to get involved in a war with Octavian. 2nd September 31 BC, the Battle of Actium. It's only on the 1st of August, 30 BC. It's nearly a year later when Octavian turns up with a fleet off the coast of Alexandria. He brushes straight past the feeble resistance that Cleopatra's military puts up, lands at the head of a Roman army, marches into Alexandria. His idea is to take Antony alive and to take Cleopatra alive. Again, he's not interested in killing them but they panic. Antony commits suicide by stabbing himself to death. He's taken off dying and dies in Cleopatra's arms. She then kills herself by applying a poisonous asp to her breast. So Octavian is robbed of having Cleopatra to march in his triumph. He's also robbed of the opportunity to forgive Antony for everything and then to put him under house arrest for the rest of his life. Whatever the case, although Octavian has lost that publicity coup of forgiving Antony and having Cleopatra walk in his triumph, he's got Egypt. It's his property. He doesn't incorporate it into the empire. It's his personal estate. He gets himself declared pharaoh, and here on the right is a representation of Octavian as the new pharaoh. What about the children? The child that Caesar fathered on Cleopatra, he has to die. He's only young, not even 15. But, well, one Caesar is quite enough for the world. Caesarian is hunted down and killed. His head is put before Octavian. Th this sounds extraordinarily cruel. However, if the boy had been left alive, 
He might have grown up as a completely blameless, loyal supporter of Octavian, but he was the real son of Julius Caesar, and he was the son of Cleopatra. It would have been so easy for those disaffected from Octavian's rule to form a party around the young man. It would have subjected the Roman world to potential and unlimited instability. Therefore, for political reasons, he had to be removed. Octavian also gets rid of the eldest son that Antony fathers on Cleopatra, because Drusus, I think his name, he's rather a headstrong young man and is inclined to avenge his father's defeat in the Civil War. However, the other two, the twins, those are taken back to Rome and farmed out among Octavian's family to be brought up as good Romans. The daughter, Antonia, she eventually marries one of the sons of Octavian's wife, not his son, but the son of his wife, and she is the mother of Germanicus, the grandmother of Caligula, and the mother of the Emperor Claudius. Octavian treats Antony's family with reasonable kindness. And that's it. That's the end of the Civil War. Here's a representation of Cleopatra's death. You can imagine that this has been a theme exciting artists ever since it happened for the past 2,000 years. Whether she looked like that, I can't say. Here's a rather silly representation. I put it in simply because I needed to balance the picture on the right. Here's a representation of Antony's death. And on the right, here's a rather strange 15th century representation. It seems that Antony is buried with the knife still sticking in his breast and Cleopatra with the snake still wrapped round her right wrist. They, they also appear to be given a send-off by a Christian monk, but never mind that. You can see that the story of Antony and Cleopatra has caught imaginations for the past 2,000 years. But that is the end of Antony and Cleopatra. You now have one empire and one ruler. There is a golden Aureus of Octavian on the left. He's the consul for the seventh time. Part of his bundle of powers involves the consulship year after year. He is also the son of... His, he is Caesar, the son of a god. And on the back, you have the legend Aegupta Capta, Egypt taken, with a, re with a representation of a crocodile for those unable to read the, the motto. At the bottom, you have a silver coin of Octavian. On the back again, showing that he is the son of the deified Julius. He is the son of a god. Not himself a god, but he is the son of a god. And there in the middle, you have the Prima Porta statue. This is how he preferred to be seen by his subjects later in life. Octavian returns to Rome in 30 BC for a three-day triumph. More propaganda. Virgil puts the Battle of Actium into Book 8 of the Aeneid, hardly mentioning Octavian, but it's quite clear what's going on. Horace writes an ode about the defeat of Cleopatra, which again doesn't say much about Octavian, but it's there. Special coins are struck with the motto Libertatis Populi Romane Vindix, Defender of the Liberty of the Roman People. You have triumphal arches. Also, the archaeologists have been turning up pottery and paintings that represent Actium from all over the empire. Octavian is now the sole ruler of the Roman world. This is what he wanted from the beginning, from the moment he got a letter from his mother saying, you know, dear boy, Caesar named you his heir. You know, you're, you're the main heir in his will. From that moment, as barely more than a boy, Octavian wanted to step into Caesar's shoes, and he's done it. He's got everything that Caesar had, and a great deal more, because this time there are no enemies alive who can do another Ides of March on him. The empire is at peace. The empire is firmly governed by Octavian from Rome. Remember, Octavian is a great deal younger than Caesar was, and people expect him to be around a great deal longer. 
and the people who might have an interest in making sure that he's not around much longer, those have been removed in various ways. Although the civil wars are over, and although the Republic is over, there are two questions outstanding. The first is, Octavian is wearing Caesar's shoes, but how long will he wear them? And the second is, what will happen when he does eventually vacate them? The same problems that Julius Caesar faced. How do you establish a legal basis under the Roman constitution for rule by one man? And how do you make sure that this rule by one man continues beyond a single lifetime? That is a problem that Caesar never solved. He was never given time to solve it. It is a problem that Octavian must deal with now that he is the sole master of the Roman world. And I'll deal with these questions next week. So that's all I have to say about the real end of the Roman Republic, so far as you can say there was one. Any questions or comments?